thanks everybody for um, uh, spending your weekend with us so far. We really appreciate it. Very quickly, I want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, yet again, it, this event absolutely would not be possible without them. Uh, this is a totally volunteer and sponsor run event. So very quickly, if we could have a round of applause for our sponsors. Thank you very much. So uh, it is my absolute honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Denise Cooper. Uh, Denise has worked at Symantec, Apple, Sun Microsystems, Revolution Analytics, and the Wikimedia Foundation. They're the nonprofit organization that runs Wikipedia, among many other uh, high-profile community-based um, content sites. She has served on the board of the Open Source Initiative and is currently a board observer at Mozilla, a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and a board member of the Drupal Association. Denise's extensive work in the open source space has earned her the nickname Open Source Diva. And today she will tell us about the past, present, and future of open source and Drupal. Uh, so Drupal Camp Austin, please join me in giving a big Texas welcome to Denise Cooper. Good. Wow. It's always weird to hear yourself big. How are you guys doing? Did you have a good camp so far? Great. This presentation, um, I gave a presentation at Bad Camp a couple of years ago, and somebody came up afterwards and said, was really angry because they felt that I, was, um, that I wasn't serious enough. And <laughs> this presentation is also a little bit humorous. I'll have to, have to warn you. It's kind of my style. But, um, but I'm very happy to answer serious questions, too. So, and I will leave time for questions at the end. So uh, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, answer them. You guys all recognize this? Is anybody old enough to recognize this image? Good job, good job. So this, is, this presentation is a little bit about hoping we don't go here <laughs> with Drupal. <laughs> OK. So um, how many of you guys were around in the beginning of, of open source, the movement? Anybody? 1983 is when Richard Stallman first stormed out of MIT. 1984 is when Bill Joy first created the BSD. It's a long time ago now. Um, I wasn't in on those early days either, but I was in the room when they said the word open source the first time. So that was 1998. But back in the good old days of software, all software was shared because, frankly, it was too buggy not to share it. People had to, people had to fix stuff all the time, and, and people talked a lot about their fixes and, and shared that information as well. And so this idea of sharing was you know, sort of a Garden of Eden, if you will, for software developers. Everybody was an equal. Even, even among uh, some of the greats were still equally sharing everything that they knew. Um, in California, oh, look, my friend Bruno's connected. I guess we're going to see my, uh, <laughs> I guess we're going to see everything that happens as it goes by. Um, this is a picture of the Homebrew Computing Club when it was in the Stanford Linear Accelerator Auditorium. You guys all know your computer history. The Homebrew Computer Club was the birthplace of companies such as Apple and Microsoft and a bunch of other companies in the Valley. But they shared information because they had no choice. I mean, it was very, very hard to, to work. They met every, every uh, month. They published a little newsletter. And um, pretty much everybody that you can name in the early days of, of personal computing at some point filtered through this club. And it wasn't that much different than you guys being here in this room. Um, and what they were talking about was sharing code. The, sometimes sharing hardware designs as well. And um, by the way, Todd left out a couple credits. I'm also on the board of the Open Source Hardware Association, which is a relatively new association trying to help people that invented things like Arduino um, figure out how to not become MakerBot for some value of not. Uh, and and um, so sharing hardware was something that they did as well. But sharing code was really mostly what they did because the hardware they mostly purchased. And, um, and what could be bad about that, right? I mean. It's, it's, it they were all hobbyists. Nobody was in making any money. Even Mitz, who was selling most of the hardware, was just barely breaking even. Um, nobody saw the Apple one coming. Nobody saw that you know, HP was going to say they didn't care about that board, and they were going to be able to found a huge, <laughs> wow, we're going to see them all. <laughs> we're going to be able to found a huge company based on that. Um, but you know, there's always somebody there to spoil the party. Um, this, for those of you who don't know, is the very young Bill Gates um, getting arrested for drunk driving in 19, uh, when he was 19, 
in yeah. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Notice he's not concerned. <laughs> this, is a, this is a famous letter that Bill wrote to the Homebrew Computing Club, and I've pulled out a quote from it. It basically is saying, you guys are stealing software. You thought you were sharing it, but you're not. You're stealing it. And specifically, he's referring to his own software. They, he and his partner, Paul, Paul Allen, had written BASIC. Um, BASIC was uh, running on every homebrew computer at the, by the time this letter was written. Uh, and, uh, and he was mad because he wanted to start making money from his, com from his software. So it, it's undeniable that the birth of that industry, the industry went proprietary very early. I worked for Apple for about six years in the relatively early days. It was, it was in the 70s. But um, they were talking a lot to developers, but they weren't asking many opinions. Mostly they were telling them what to do. And when I got involved in, in open source, it was all about being, you know, the industry was all about being told what to do. Microsoft was telling its customers what they wanted. They weren't asking, they were telling them. So was Apple. And they weren't very good at guessing, so <laughs> it was problematic. And coders, such as yourselves, you guys all code, that's what you're doing here, were, were locked in. I mean, there, there was no way to fix problems. You had to wait for the big company to decide that it wanted to get around to doing that. And those decisions were not based on how many people were upset with them. It was mostly, had they gotten all the money they were going to get out of the last version before they pushed a new version, whether your bug was going to be fixed or not was really up in the air. So this was, this was the birth of open source. Here he is. You guys know who this is? Richard Stallman. This is Richard Stallman wearing a disk drive as a, as a halo. Um, he doesn't do this anymore. But there are plenty of pictures of it. <laughs> and I'll tell you that I, I had occasion more than once to experience St. Genesius. Um, one time I was in a, a really swanky London hotel, and Richard came to meet me, and for some reason decided that the people in this lobby needed to meet St. Genesius. And so he threw on the garb, and they were pretty, pretty nonplussed, I have to say. They weren't quite sure he was blessing the computers. And <laughs> but, you know, let's, let's give Richard his due. He, is the guy that put on it, strapped on his sandals and, and walked through the desert of the beginnings of the idea of free software. Um, I don't think it probably would have happened without somebody quite this iconoclastic. Bill Joy was just being, um, I mean, I've heard him say he was just being expedient in his choice of Berkeley licensing. And, and mostly he was, wasn't thinking about making money with it because he worked for a university. Um, he just wanted to share. He was still stuck in the old paradigm. But Richard famously came to the conclusion that he needed to start a brave new world because he was an MIT grad student who kind of overstayed his welcome. Like he was done with his degree and still showing up every day to play on the computer. And at some point, MIT went, wow, we should put passwords on this thing. And they didn't give him one. <laughs> and he was pretty mad, you know. And so he went home and he thought about it and he thought about it. And he decided that he needed to completely rewrite the world in an open way, in a free and open way. And he invented the four freedoms. You guys all know the four freedoms by heart? This is, this is what free and open source software means. It's the freedom to run. And by the way, the, the things that are in blue, if you can see them in blue, those are, the, those are actually relevant words in copyright law. So the freedom to run the program, the freedom to study and change, to help your neighbor, which is to say to redistribute, and to contribute changes. So modify, you run, look at and modify, redistribute. Those are the big things. And every open source piece of software has to do this. During the time that I worked at the OSI and I was there for 10 years, we were mostly arguing with companies that wanted to break one of these. Now the open source initiative has a longer version of this called the open source definition, but it's basically the same set of things. So we'd get a lot of my business I really want to do open source, but my business needs the following carve out. We heard that endlessly, and we endlessly knocked it down. And we're hearing that even today. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It, everybody's a special case out there in the world, and it's been very hard to uphold the idea of what essential freedom is. And so I want you guys to appreciate it's been a long haul. And you know, Richard's been at it for 20 years now, tw almost 30 years now. And, and, um, and it's really something what he's done. But of course, the term free, you remember the picture of the bear with the beer, 
the term free in, in English means too many things, and it was really hard to sell. I spent 10 years flying around the world talking to people about software that they could use without paying Microsoft money. And of course, it sounded too good to be true. But if, if you called it free software, it just made it that much more confusing. So Tim O'Reilly, who's the gentleman on the left in this picture, is the one who coined the term open source, said, wow, what if we called it something else? And Tim saw excellent software being produced, but he saw the political rhetoric that came along with the free software movement uh, as being damaging to the adoption by governments and business. And he wasn't wrong. Um, I traveled all around the world talking to people. Um, and you could always tell if Microsoft had been there first, because the first question you get is, but is it legitimate? But what about legitimacy? As though this were some bastard you know, event that was happening. It was very bizarre language that was coming out of the anti-open source movement. Well, so they didn't win, right? That, by the way, this is, not, this is in no way a representative smattering. However, these logos are all round. Um, <laughs> almost all of this software is licensed. Uh, actually, I think it's all licensed under, the, under a version of, or a GPL-related license. Let me say that. Mozilla, of course, has its own license in addition to, be, in addition to having um, uh, LGPL. And um, these, this software, do you guys know what all these are? Do you know what the... the the T with the red, the circle? Anybody know what that is? No, no, no. <laughs> these, are, these are open source companies, my friend. Uh, <laughs> no, that is Thought. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Thought started in a garage by a 21-year-old um, undergrad in South Africa, which he sold at the peak of its ripeness for several hundred million dollars. And that's what started the fortune that is now Ubuntu. That's Mark Shuttleworth's first company. So these are what I tried to do was pick companies that had enormous share or, or serious impact or, or had generated serious money. So, and this is, a, this is interesting. Um, when I was on the OSI board, we dreamed of this map. We wanted a map where we could show people as we were traveling around the world explaining open source to people. We wanted to show them where adoption was happening and you know, proof that it was real. I did, a, I did a talk once um, I w in India. This kid came up to me after the talk and he said, would you please talk to my school? Because they're trying to kick me out. I said, well, why are they trying to kick you out? He said, because I don't want to sit in COBOL class. All I do all day is play with Linux and they're really mad at me. <laughs> and they really are going to kick me out. You know? and, and so um, I ended up going to his school. It's a long story. But um, his father was in the audience when I gave that talk. And his father came up afterwards, and he was crying, and he said, thank you for telling me this is real. It was really hard to believe him because nobody else is doing this. This was in 1994 in, in India. And, you know, he's kind of a big deal today, that kid. So it, it, it w there was a time when it was a risky business. But I, I, this is an old copy of this slide, so this isn't current data, because apparently Red Hat was intimidated into taking this down because it runs on JavaScript. And therein you have an, a, an interesting problem in the open source community. Um, the, the sort of pr the purity test, not everything can pass the purity test and it's problematic. Um, and it's a tough line to, to draw. I mean, when I worked for Wikimedia, uh, I spent a lot of time saying no to people that wanted to give us free stuff because it wasn't open enough because that's, that's a free software platform. Um, and there's things that Wikimedia didn't do well for a really long time because of that. So, you know, it's definitely, there's definitely a religious aspect to it. So not everyone is pleased that open source has succeeded. Seriously, not everyone. And here's my other gratuitous kick at Microsoft. Um, I was forced to take this slide out of a stack that I gave to the Gates Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I put it in there to see if they'd let me, let me use it, and <laughs> no way, you know, they weren't gonna let me use it. But the idea is, it really was an organized effort to kill this as soon as they figured out that it was going to take any kind of, of um, market share. So in 1993, when um, Linus Torvalds decided that he was going to write a Linux kernel, or co-write, because he almost immediately asked other people to help, um, he was flying under the radar. I, you know, nobody cared. Nobody thought that it was going to go anywhere. In 1998, I was at Sun. And they were passing around the first memos to say, maybe we should open Solaris, because this Linux thing is starting to get a little traction. 
I went to a, a business meeting for them uh, in, I think, 99, and it was at um, a major trading house, and the meeting was in London. It was, I was supporting uh, Sun's sales engineers at that time who did not understand what their customer was asking them. And the customer was saying, look, I think I figured out that I can, I can parallelize Linux and using lots of commodity boxes make a pretty big computer. And I think that means I don't need any more Solaris boxes. Thank you. And they just, they did not see it coming. They didn't even know how to talk to the guy. Um, it, was, it was a fascinating thing. And, and um, that he wasn't, they weren't the only one. You guys know who Richard Clark is? Yeah, he wrote a book, this book. This is a story that I haven't told too many times. Um, so you guys are among the first to hear this story. I went to see Richard Clark when he was in charge of the NSA's um, sort of technology arm. He was their expert on cybersecurity. I didn't mean to go see him. Actually, Tim O'Reilly was going to go see him. And, and we were in DC together, and we were having dinner. And Tim said, do you know anything about the certification of Linux for the use by the government? And I said, yeah, I do, actually. And he said, could you come to a meeting with me? Because <laughs> I don't really know too much about it, and this guy wants to have a meeting. And we went into this room, and uh, first of all, he was late coming in, and then he was really hostile. And he kept saying, you Linux people. I don't know why you Linux people can't make this work for us. I don't know why you can't be more secure. I don't, I want, you're going to have to change. And he, he was just so vituperative, and I finally said, OK, first of all, we are not you Linux people. They're mostly not that c concerned about whether or not the US government can use their operating system. They're not going to change it for you at all. And you're going to either figure out how to use it, or, you're gonna, or the boat's going to sail without you. And I don't know how to help you otherwise. You know, I mean, you, you have the wrong idea about the asymmetrical power structure that you think you're in here. Um, <laughs> He didn't like that very much. He had a really hard time with it. And Tim, as we were leaving, said, boy, I can't take you anywhere. <laughs> but now, as you all know, we have WhiteHouse.gov. We have the, the White House actually giving Drupal code because um, they would like to see it maintained over a long haul. They'd like to see people continue to use it. Um, when I talked to them, and I did talk to them recently, how many of you know that they had briefly had an organizational bit that allowed them to commit as an organization. You know about this? This was, you can find this in the, in the there was a, a huge discussion about or organizational commi commit bits. Basically, um, after Nixon, there was a law passed that said that everything the president does, every, every messaging moment that, that happens in the lifetime of a presidency has to be archived because they didn't ever want secret tape thing again. And of course, they were contemplating, you know, phone messages, maybe e early emails at that point, and tape, physical media. They weren't thinking about things like websites. But um, it turns out this is, by law, has to be archived in a way, in, in the Library of Congress, in a way that people can study it later. And when I say this, I mean all of WhiteHouse.gov's interactions with the Drupal community <laughs> have to be archived at the end of Obama's presidency. So they were very worried about that. They wanted to create an aggregation point so that they could easily pull all the commits and all the comments and all the conversation together in one place. And um, the first pass on how to do that was to give them a commit bit. But then, uh, then I showed up at a board meeting and said, you do not want corporate personhood <laughs> in your open source project. You want individual personhood. And we can give them attribution. Let's, let's aggregate it that way. And so we have just finished negotiating with them about aggregating it differently. And um, this was a huge topic in Portland at DrupalCon. And, and uh, I think the good news is they were very open to doing things the right way. And that's a huge sea change from I'm going to tell you how it's going to be to let me see how I can work with you to get this to happen properly. Um, the White House is definitely another case of we have special needs just like every open source project or every, every big company that comes to open source, we have special needs. Um, but they're surprisingly, they were surprisingly malleable to the idea that maybe their needs weren't so special, which was good. And I think we can all say that Drupal in the White House is a good thing, right? It's good for all of us because it legitim further legitimizes the platform. Not that The Economist and Yale and you know, all the other places that use Drupal every day, but this is kind of a big one. And, and 
at least for, our, for the domestic market. OK. But I said I was going to talk about the future, the future of Drupal. I think that there are some good, some, there's some good news and there's some scary news on the horizon. First of all, as near as I can tell, it's all about community, really. Um, I'm, I've been a member of the Apache Software Foundation for a decade now, and they actually say, we're here for the community. This is community over code. If you go look by, by, um, by downloads, I think Apache is slightly leading all of their software projects in terms of, of actual use of code, but they care more about community, which is really fascinating, and I think we should too. This, by the way, is uh, a picture of DrupalCon Belgium, tiny little DrupalCon, that's everybody that came, and here we are last month. It's it, part of why I agreed to be on this board, or three reasons. First of all, Drupal has the best gender balance of any open source project that's ever existed. I find that fascinating, and I wanted to know more about that. So I wanted to study that carefully. Secondly, it's growing. It's still growing. You know, it's, it's, it's actually an amazing opportunity to see it grow. And believe it or not, you guys are all on the ground floor of that still. This is, still, this is actually still the ground floor. But thirdly, the, the number of lifestyle companies that live in Drupal is unusual. That means, you know, one guy, two guys, two people. Uh, can get together and have a company and make a living. Um, we used to talk, when we talked about open source, we used to talk about the robber baron period of, of um, building infrastructure in this country, where a very few people got Im unimaginably wealthy. And um, they did it, you know, the old fashioned way by exploiting um, underprivileged classes. And then later on in the history of transportation, when we started having roads pervasively in this country, then we had. Um, companies like General Motors, which at one, at one time uh, actually employed 1% of the entire workforce of the country, uh, excluding the farm people. So, you know, that was a lot of people making enough money to send their kids to, sco to school, to own a house, the sort of American dream. And, and I think Drupal is, is an example of that democratization thanks to the lifestyle companies. So, um, way to go there. This is a little bit of information from Forrester. Not that I think Forrester is particularly um, authoritative, because of course you can uh, buy their opinions a little bit. But they looked at all CMSs, and what they had to say about Drupal was the association and the fact that it's a community and, and that it stayed together as a community is, is really impressive and also really interesting. Um, and, and it they basically said, you know, you guys need to keep doing more of the right things that you've been doing. Now, there are some problems, but keeping the community together and growing the community is going to be so important to the future of this movement. So I want to, if you didn't go to, how many of you went to DrupalCon Portland? Cool. So you guys all know this lady then. This is Holly. Um, this year, uh, after a few years of, of really good service, our, um, our previous uh, executive director of the Drupal Association asked to be excused because he wanted to go back to, you know, making money. And um, this woman had worked for a company called, uh, or an organization called N10, which it, um, educated people about, or nonprofits, about the use of technology. And she built N10. People will tell you she was N10. Um, she lives in Portland already, which is where the Drupal Association is located, and, and she agreed to come on board even though she didn't know very much about Drupal, and in fact didn't know too much about open source, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, but she has really, really hit the ground running, and she's, she's um, a dynamo, and I think she's going to do some very interesting things for the association. Um, the bullets on the right are the actual charter <laughs> of the Drupal Association which exists to maintain the infrastructure that, that the code lives in, to empower the community to protect, to protect its assets through legal advocacy and, and direct advocacy, to um, organize and promote events, which is what, the, what they're mostly known for at this point, and to communicate the benefits of Drupal to the world. So it's an educational nonprofit. And um, this, is a, this is the survey page for 2013. How many of you filled out the survey? Probably nobody in this room. Please go fill out the survey. I know it's like, really? Not another survey. But they, use, they actually use the data that they gather from this stuff. And they also actually poll the membership. They, they really care. I know that Drupal Association, like the Wikimedia Foundation, was founded after the project had already grown to significant size. 
Um, Drupal Association was founded in 2006. But there wouldn't be great big Drupal events without this kind of organization. There, arguably, D.O could be better, but D.O probably wouldn't be in the shape that it's in now. Um, this model of having a foundation that protects the assets is really worked for a lot of open source projects. I mean, Apache is, has a foundation, Mozilla has a foundation. It, I mean, Dries did a good thing when he did this. And membership is, is one of the main ways that they keep the lights on. So, you know, I'm a member, obviously. I, kind of have to be, um, but it was painless. It cost me no money, almost, you know, 20 bucks. It's pretty low <laughs> for, for everything that you get. How many of you gave money to Wikipedia last year? Bless you all. It's about the same deal. It's about the same deal. And if you're involved in making money with Drupal, you really want to be a member of this, but even if you're just learning. So there's, there's my important pitch. And if you guys have questions about the association, I'm happy to answer them during the Q&A. So what else is coming in the future? You guys know about Drupal 8. You've probably heard quite a bit about it over this weekend. Um, Drupal 8 is going to be a lot different than previous Drupals. It, it's, uh, it's the first time that not every scrap of Drupal was hand rolled by a Drupal hand. And, I, and honestly, I think that's a huge step forward. That's a really hard thing for a, for a project to consider. It, you know, leveraging another technology. But if you go, if we go back to that list of great projects, uh, great open source projects, almost all of them do leverage other technologies. So I'm glad to see that Drupal's finally joining that those ranks. Um, number one issue <laughs> is definitely the talent gap. You guys know this graph. The top line, for those of you in the back who can't see, the top line is what it's like to learn Drupal, and that there's a cliff there, and there's. There's some, there's some people dying on the hill. There's a lot of stuff that happens. Um, it is hard, hard to learn, still a little too hard to learn. Um, there's some reasons for that. You can do a lot more with it once you've learned it. Um, as it was described to me, after you get over the cliff, after you've, after you've um, perfected bouldering and you've gotten over the lip and you're past the crucifixion, um, <laughs> You can do anything, right? <laughs> now, this, this has to change. This, this is too hard. It has to change. It's, and to me, when I talk to the board about year-to-year -year focus, to me, the biggest thing we have to work on is this talent gap problem. Um, it's a known problem. There's been, I, I went out and did a sort of informal survey of some of the artwork that's been done around the problem. <laughs> Um, the one on the, on the right is really interesting. Um, it's, it explains module uh, um, ownership and, and, and ongoing work on modules. Uh, abandoned modules is a huge problem. And after you guys are, when you guys are starting to boulder over the cliff, getting into the world of modules and really looking at improving the ones that you're having trouble with is a good way to go. Um, even just starting that is, is, is an excellent idea. But I really want to plant the seed that mentorship should be something that this community works harder at achieving. Um, I think we should maybe even make it um, a core value of the community that you get extra brownie points for being a mentor. Because mentorship works. Mentorship, that's basically, that's what um, WebChick does every day, right? When I started looking at why there's such good gender balance, it's because Angie is, is gender blind completely. When she answers a question, she has no thought about who she's talking to. Everybody gets the same answer. And she's always helpful, and she's always helping people figure stuff out. And, and Dries has that tone as well. I'm giving her the credit, because it's rare to get to put a, a girl up. But um, she, this, is an, this is an awesome asset in, in, in the world of Drupal. And I want every single one of you to consider becoming a mentor. Because right after you're done, right after you pass the crucifixion, you really ought to look over your shoulder to see if you can leg somebody up on the, the bouldering aspect of, of things. I think the more of this that happens, the better. And I have actually proposed to the association that we start tracking mentorship as a, as a karma deriving activity, because I think it's going to be important, increasingly important. So. Um, those of you who don't see XKCD um, in real time, this is the current comic. Um, and, you know, 
And when I worked for Wikipedia, every time he wrote about Wikipedia, we were excited. It was like, we're in the news again, you know. And I went looking for a Drupal when I couldn't find one. So there's something to aspire to, <laughs> get, a, get a good XKCD up. But I think this one is, is, uh, applies to any project that we work on that's open source. And um, so in closing, I really think that you guys and the extent to which you help out are the future of Drupal. And you don't have to live in core to be that helper. In fact, it's almost really important for people that aren't in core to get involved in helping. Todd or anybody else that has a company that makes money using Drupal can tell you it's not easy to hire people that know this stuff. They do a lot of training. You know, people that leave those companies leave better than they started. It's a, so you know, think about that Boy Scout, mo uh, Boy Scout motto of leaving the campground cleaner than you found it. it I really think this is going to be key. And I'm going to be saying this a lot, and I'm going to be pushing it a lot until I feel like we have a program that, that recognizes people that, that are getting involved and helping other people get better at it, because that is the big issue. What we don't want to have happen, I mean, if, we, if we're going to get to that horrible scenario at the beginning of this, it's, that will happen because people can't find people to write Drupal sites for them, and they give up, and they go to somewhere else. That's how that's going to happen. So it, I think it's up to all of us to fix that problem. And, and uh, the DA, I will be pushing them to get there, um, but you're, it's going to take everybody, I think. All right, and now we have the question answer portion of the show. I know you all have tough and horrible questions for me. Come on, don't be shy. No, not even one? I obviously wasn't controversial enough. Yes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an interesting problem, isn't it? Um, there are, are towns that don't have anything to do with Drupal. I know when DrupalCon was in Chicago, I was talking to you know the um, Tiffany. I'm like, so congratulations, you got a DrupalCon. Um, you know, how's that affecting your Drupal market? She said, God, I hope it does. I hope it affects us because frankly, this is a WordPress town. You know, and 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 um, Portland is a Drupal town. Um, I think tech, I think Austin is a Drupal town. I'm pretty sure that's true. Yeah. I do, but I'm not allowed to tell you. And the reason I'm not allowed to tell you is because as soon as they announce it, the hotels get too expensive. So oh, 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 good. Okay, then yes, I do. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that would be Diana, who's going to who's going to whip this town into shape for Drupal Club. <laughs> Are you, is it on you? Oh, good. <laughs> Well, that means it'll be a lot of fun. And so I say the first thing you do is look at how they did Portland, and particularly around the food cart issue. See if you can you know, negotiate a passport or something for everybody, right? That'd be kind of cool. Can you come to the boss? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, f what time is the boss? Four o'clock, but we can move it. <laughs> it needs to be earlier, yeah, because I have, I have a 5.30 flight. So yes, there's a question over there. Mm -hmm. About two years ago, I started an intelligence training for marketing and we've been training people free for, for years. And uh, starting next month, we have a, a module development boot camp, a 10 week series over four months. And one of the ways that developers need to support a program like that is through sponsorships from local area Drupal development companies and startup companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me repeat the question because I forgot in the last question round that I was supposed to repeat the question. So the, this is a gentleman who already has a mentorship program in, in Los Angeles and is about to do a module um, section, 10-week module section for Drupal and um, is looking for sponsorship and is surprised to find that nobody in the LA area wants to sponsor him. And so he's questioning you know, how to get that done. Well, I know this meetup is, is partially happening because of a grant from the Drupal Association. Now, I'm not, I can't say, well, we'll give you money, because that's not how the Drupal Association board works. But we have been very interested in exploring 
ways to help people that are trying to do stuff like what you're trying to do. So I think I'd send a note to Holly and, and see if you can get a conversation going there. Um, but I mean, that's, that would be the first thing I would do. So uh, again, I think the most important thing we can work on is training more developers. And um, to that end, I actually recruited a board member, Samir Verma, from the, in the last round, who is a um, professor at uh, SFSU, San Francisco City College. And um, he not only created a, a history of training people in Drupal, he makes his MIS students, you know, who are going to be bosses, stand up a Drupal website and deliver their homework that way. Because he feels like literacy in basic CMSs is, is like how office productivity suites used to be. You know, everybody needs to know how to do this. And so he makes them do that. And um, he has been very successful, so successful, in fact, that the whole Cal State system is now standardized on Drupal. And most of his CS students that specialize in Drupal go straight into employment with Cal State because they can't find developers except they've got a, a farm for them. So there's lots of experience that shows that it works. Um, and, and it, you know, if I, were, if I were queen of the forest, a, a lot of the Drupal Association's efforts would be in support of these kinds of things. So I'd say right to Holly. Okay. Yeah. Are there any open source projects you feel did it wrong that you could learn from? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that is just an excellent question. I think we can learn a lot from this. Oh, there's a question. This, this was, remi remember to say the question again. Um, he wanted to know if there were any open source projects that are, that are counter patterns, anti patterns, people who got it wrong. Um, I think we can look carefully at BSD um, as an example of a grassroots project that really got it wrong. They got it right in the sense, I mean, you know, all my BSD friends are now hating my guts, but B BSD is an amazing kernel. It's inside the Mac. It's, um, it's yet another rewrite of, of um, Unix, the one that Bill Joyce started back in the day. But they fragmented pretty badly, and they did it over personality mostly. So there are variants of BSD, too many variants of BSD, to ever make it the, the first choice. Because you have to disambiguate which one do I care about and understand that whole morass. And I think that's problematic. So, so um, that issue about forking really is a problem, particularly if the reason you're forking is because your community can't get along, fundamentally doesn't get along. Um, and then there are lots and lots of failed open source projects that were started by companies, some of which I was involved with. Um, it's very hard to teach an old dog new tricks. Um, in, my, in my business practice, what I do is consult to entities that want to figure out how to do open source. And honestly, it's, it's for every uh, customer that's wonderful and gets it, and the reason they wanted you was because they just weren't sure, and the, you know, they just want to know how to make the right choices, but they're basically going to get there. There are five that are going to, you know, make you watch your blood drip out of your veins before they, are, yeah, I mean, it's just an awful experience to talk to one of these guys. And they've got the resources, they've got the reason to get it right, but they just can't culturally change enough to get there. It's really problematic. And then Todd and I have had actually more than one experience with um, people who can't understand Agile. It doesn't fit their waterfall-inspired program management regime, and, and they just make themselves all miserable, all kind of miserable about how they're going to get what they want in the time that they want and the money that they want. And they end up making more trouble for themselves than if they had just gotten on the, on the surfboard with you and paddled along. <laughs> they probably would have gotten there faster. So um, yeah, I think keeping your community get together, um, getting in it for the right reasons and being willing to change are the, are the, the big things. And honestly, I think, uh, again, Drupal's doing pretty well in all those categories. But keeping the community together means people identifying themselves as members of the community. And um, that's not just wearing a t-shirt, although wearing a t-shirt helps. It does. Um, the whole reason, you guys know why there are, uh, why there are t-shirts in tech, right? It's free advertising every time you wear it. Uh, and that's why they give them away, too. Every time you wear it, you're advertising for that, that entity. Um, years and years ago, the first Java one, the guy that put it on went, what if I gave everybody a really nice bag and then they'd carry it around forever? And he was right. I mean, how many of you have seen a Java one bag 
you know, in an airport somewhere. Even to this day, people are carrying them. It's amazing. So, anybody else? Back there. I think there's a question is, um, does, how does Drupal Ladder Project and, and other mentoring efforts fit into what I'm talking about? I think that they're not, there isn't enough community focus on that as a core good. I think the people who started that stuff are in exactly the right place. But when I hear them talk about it, it it's not an amplified conversation. It's um, we over here in this corner are doing this thing. Look, it's Gina. <laughs> We over there in, in this corner of the world are trying to do something. It's not every Drupal developer thinking, wow, have I helped somebody today? And I think it's going it, to, it, that kind of change, that much more focus would mean all the difference to this community to really make it a core value. So yeah, I think the latter is, is, is an excellent start. Um, I first learned about it a couple of Drupal, uh, a couple of bad camps ago, because you know, bad camp is my local, right? And, and I, was, I was encouraged, except that there was almost nobody in the room as these people were talking about it. That's the problem. So maybe we need to simplify it further so that, it's, so that people that use Drupal feel more connected to it or something. There's, there's got to be a way to make, did you help somebody today, a bigger deal, I think. Yeah, the, so that, this is a comment from the audience. He's saying that maybe the problem with existing mentorship efforts is that it's just not been marketed properly, that it needs more, more of a thrust, and, and, and uh, maybe have you helped somebody today is a good idea. Yeah? If I may uh, have a question again. Mm -hmm. But it's completely daunting. So that, that, that was a comment about, about the value of the community and drawing people into the community. Um, yeah, I'm not necessarily saying that one-on-one -on -one mentoring is the ideal paradigm. Right now, I would love to see D.O have lots more resources that are mentoring resources um, where people can get together. One of the things that we did for Wikipedia back in the day, it's really hard to learn um, uh, wiki markup language if you're not already inclined to markup language. You know, and so there are a lot of people who are frustrated in their efforts to try to write content for Wikipedia because they didn't learn markup. And um, in these days, I mean, just right now, they're putting finally putting a visual editor out, um, which you know we don't have WYSIWYG yet exactly, right? So, um, but uh, before that happened, the most successful program was a mentorship program where they would pair content experts with editorial experts and get them to work together. Well, so when I was working at Wikimedia Foundation, I really wanted to see the tools re reflect that need. So um, if you, have you ever used Etherpad? Well, you've used, you've used Google Drive, you've used Etherpad at this point. The, the idea that more than one person can be in content simultaneously so that they don't have to meet in meet space to, to meet and get work done, I think more of that kind of tooling will be really helpful to help newbies along. Um, there are a lot of projects where the fact that you just created an account means you get an email that talks to you about who's, what, who's able to mentor you. You know what I mean? There's like a pairing that happens right away. And that person's job is to pull you in. Because of course, you don't, wanna, you don't want each person to have to hand raise a new developer. You want to get them to over the hump of understanding what it's going to be like to work with a lot of people. It takes a village. It takes a village. So I think your point is well taken. Um, it was my point. I, but you were, you were asking me to disambiguate between, between individual one-on-one -on -one mentoring and bringing people into the community. Ultimately, the community is what's going to foster people's 
long-term growth. Um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, as AA knows, it's not just your sponsor, it's also your, your meeting <laughs> that gets you through. So anybody else? Other questions? Oh, come on. I have another oh, good. <laughs> Well, I can tell, so the question is, will the Drupal Association take a more active role in, um, in the evolution of Drupal, particularly uh, the upgrade path from one version to the next? Um, so as we're talking about the rollout of Drupal 8, we're talking quite a bit about the failures of previous version changes and, and how to avoid some of those failures, how to get more people in a good place earlier. Um, and, and so I think we're very aware of that issue and, and definitely having a lot of conversation about it. The, it's been interesting working with Holly. We've had her you know, just a few months now. She has a much clearer picture of what the staff's role is versus what the board's role, the foundation's role is. And, um, and I think some of the, shall we say, lack of momentum that we've seen in the past from the association is gonna change because because she has a very clear drive and picture of, of how she wants to fill gaps. And she's heard a lot of stories about, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, the Drupal Association itself is still not on Drupal 7. So she's heard a lot, of, a lot of stories about that. I imagine that there will be um, a better experience for people generally. And I think it's mostly going to be her dragging it out of us. Does that make sense? Good. Anybody else? What are you guys doing over there that are looking at your computers? <laughs> Facebook? Is it Facebook? No, tell me it's not Facebook. OK, good. <laughs> All right, well, so um, let's see if I have anything else that I really want to say. Oh, um, so I actually, my, my original board uh, tenure was for two years. And um, they wanted me to come mostly because uh, I'm the first external to the community board member. They wanted to professionalize and bring more of a, of a real working board relationship because I guess previously the Drupal board was, everybody on the board actually worked on the website every day and you know, it, was, it was a much more hands-on earlier incarnation. Um, most of my role on the board has been to help them understand some of the lessons that previous projects that I've worked on have learned and, and to guide them in, in some right directions when I, when I think I see it. Um, and as I said, I wanted, what I wanted to get out of it was to learn more about why the, the gender balance is the way it is, um, why the momentum was, was continuing to grow, how that, you know, what was watering all of that, and a little bit about the ecosystem. So now, here I am at the end of my two years, and um, in the last board retreat, I used to run the nomination committee for board appointed slots. And uh, in the last retreat, they asked me if I wanted to be on the board again. Um, so they'll be considering whether they want to continue to have me. And I, so I spent some time thinking about what it is that makes me interested in this community. And um, it really is to see if we can move that, that needle um, so that the demand matches, um, matches the available talent. And it's a tricky thing to do because, you know, part of that pent-up demand is why you guys can charge what you charge for work on Drupal. So we don't want to kill that. But at the same time, we don't want to see um, undercutting happening. One of the reasons that I was so interested in the organizational commit bit is um, there are shops in India that want to hide the identity of their developers, the individual developers, under an organizational commit bit so that they won't potentially lose talent because they don't want the community to know about who's doing the work. And boy, I had a very strong reaction to that. I think a lot of why people do open source is because it builds their reputation and it makes their lives a little bit better. And um, I think about you know, the entertainment industry would never allow the credits to not include the names of the people that worked on the film. That's just insane. And so, um, so anyway, I think that, that continuing to be a community of individuals where everybody gets credit for what they work on is going to be really important going forward. Um, and to that end, I think you are going to see some changes in 
the things that you can do um, when you create an account, the, if you create an organizational account, you're going to be shortly told that you're not therefore going to get to commit or do any a lot of the things that individuals can do. But what you can do is get credit for work that your organization is doing. You, so you can now, you'll be able to build a report that lists all of the modules that your organization has worked on. And um, we think that that's going to be an effective recruiting tool for people that are trying to get new talent. But you guys have probably all already figured out that you have to grow your talent at this stage it, because it's so much nicer than stealing it from your neighbors. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's asking about the corporate sponsorship that was put together during Drupal 8 to um, fund the development of specific modules. And he's asking if we're going to continue that. Yeah, I think that you, you will see um, many more opportunities for, for corporations, or well, say for organizations, to get, uh, get credit for the work that they're doing, which they will use then as, as marketing tool, I think. Um, and you know, we all know there's, there is that one big fish in this pond, and then there's a, f there's a bunch of middle-sized fish, but there's that one big one. <laughs> Um, I think getting more name credit for the, the middle-sized fish is one of the things that we aspire to. And, um, and then helping some of the little fish grow into middle-sized fish uh, is, is another thing that we aspire to. It'd be nice if we had a, a, um, more than one really big fish. That'd be good. Uh, I, and uh, you know, I think it goes without saying that they've been doing a lot of uh, donation work on the core for, many, for a really long time. But spreading that load is also about expanding the community and not just you know, sitting back and waiting for the, for the one to get things done for you. Because as we have learned from, to, to talk about counter, pattern, um, counter uh, patterns, it's not always true that the deep pocket sticks around. I'm not saying this is going to happen in this case with, with that company, but if you look at, say, MySQL, I spend a lot of time talking to Monty Wadenius uh, in the wake of selling his company for uh, more money than he ever thought he'd see, and then getting really upset because he, along with that transaction and subsequent transaction to his worst competitor, he lost access to the technology that he invented. It's, it's sort of problematic, you know? So we're, this is going to be a long movement. We're at the very, very beginning of it, and we're going to see a lot of ownership change and a lot of, you know, movership change. One of the ways that Apache has weathered that, and there's been a ton of that at Apache, where a, a given project will get started by one or two deep pockets, and, and um, then when they meet their business objectives, maybe they stop investing in that project and it kind of languishes. It's, and, and so they've had to come up with rules for change to, to make sure that the things that are valuable continue to grow. And, um, you know, I think we may find ourselves in that position at some point as well. I think the corporate sponsorship th thing is a good start towards acknowledging that it's going to take more than just the volunteers working out of the kindness of their hearts. Um, the article that Dries did, it's been a few years now, about why he started Acquia is another good example. There's nothing wrong with, nobody says you can't have money in open source. There's nothing, I mean, that, that set of, of companies that I picked, those are all companies that have a fair amount of money behind them. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. So <laughs> growing that pot uh, appreciably is, should be another goal of all of ours and, and of the foundation. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> so the question was, 
what tricks do I know to get people to come to open source shops um, and, and work at them? And, 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 and I'm going to extrapolate here in a world where you could um, you know, go to Google and get a free massage after lunch every day. <laughs> Part of part of why I was so in favor of the of of the um, the attribution the organizational attribution idea is because I think wow they're really working on interesting stuff at the end of the day becomes one of the main motivators for um, people to want to join and uh, as you know my my consulting business being about helping people get to open source that's one of the healthiest reasons to want to open source one of your assets is because people developers are going to find it sexy and therefore going to want to come to work for you. So, so being more proactive in your marketing around the stuff that you built, um, and I think that's going to be a really big deal in the future. Um, because, you know, it's a seller's market right now for, for Drupal talent, really. And, and, and um, getting kids to realize that there's, a, that there's a career to have behind Drupal is another thrust. Which is why I was so excited about Samir joining the board because you know he's done a, a ton of that. And um, last year we we actually had uh, education at a university level as one of our sort of stretch goals that we didn't make it to for the board. Um, so this year it, the the board got more realistic and they decided that they weren't even going to list that in the stretch goals because there's so many other problems to solve first. So Samir and Donna Benjamin and I, who are all on the board decided to just start our own little project <laughs> around that. And um, you're going to start seeing us talking quite a bit more about assets that we are aggregating for people to teach uh, in, in pre-work settings. The other thing I'll tell you that worked pretty well for Wikimedia Foundation for me there, consider hiring kids that are still in school on, uh, on a limited basis. We used to have to limit them to, you know, can we just don't work for us more than four hours a day? because we want you to still graduate. And in fact, we used to give little grants when they graduated. We give them a little hoopla because they made it through, you know, because um, it's very tempting after you start making money to stop going to school. But uh, I think that that would be an interesting program is to start matching promising kids with actual companies and, and you know, doing better internships because that's a good way to pre-vet employees. And then it's your job to make the, convince them that even though they're going to work hard, they're also going to have a lot of fun. And, you know, I think at most, most Drupal companies I've seen know how to do that pretty well. That's the beer part. Okay, I think that was my last question. So um, I will be around for a bit yet. Apparently I'm going to a boff. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on, on winning, on winning uh, DrupalCon. And um, yeah.